Pretty hard. All right. All right. Let's start going around. Um, I think most of the other branches got probably one of the many roles. Uh, he's been many talents and worked in many departments. Uh, but for us, he's done a lot of things, including uh, his work with the ICU and as head of the CF uh, program. Um, and uh, today, he's going to talk to us about near-fatal asthma, a uh, disorder that we hope continues to disappear over time. Hopefully. Um, this is my uh, first venue into the new iPad Pro, so I have an iPad pen, so I'm cool. Uh, and so I'm going to try to make it more interactive, but if I screw up, bear with me. Um, so uh, anyway, um, and the reason why I, I uh, actually chose this topic is because it's huge, and it's uh, Donald Trumpism. It's huge, but <clears throat> it is huge, and there's you know almost two million ED visits, and we see it a lot. If you work in the ED, and you're a pediatrician, you you in and around the ER at any time, you're going to see asthma. If you're in the clinic, you're going to see asthma. The problem is, and this is what's really sad, is those 4,200 deaths, if you look at it, actually a third are children. Of those third, and this is the scary part, 85% were seen in the previous 24 hours by a healthcare practitioner and they died within that 24 hours. So we're missing something, right? We're not good enough at, at really recognizing this disease. And the reason is, is because I think we've had an educational gap in really what this disease is. And the more I deal with this disease, and we deal with a lot in the ICU, is the scarier it gets. And so there is no disease, ARDS, sepsis, nothing scares me like asthma. One, because it's hard to diagnose. It's hard to know when they get bad. When they get bad, they get bad quick. And then when they get bad quick, you've got to intervene quick. And then you've got to prevent complications and then try to not let them die. That sounds easy, but if you look at it, they die all the time. They die quick. And they usually die, actually half of those that die, die at home or die on the way to the hospital. But 85% of those were seen in a clinic somewhere. So we're missing the boat, and we're missing it, I think, in a very big way. If you look at it, uh, the percentage that occurs, uh, whites, Hispanics, Asians, but if you look at our particular population and really why we see, it's almost double. And there, what we're finding out is there may be some very genomic very pharmacogenomic reasons why these patients not only have a higher incidence, but maybe why these patients are also the ones that are highest risk of death. And so that's what we really want to try to concentrate on uh, this morning. To me, when I look at asthma, when I went to med school, it was a very, very simple disease. You basically had an allergen, you know, it stimulated IgE, it went to a mast cell, Right? Everything degranulated, you got a little inflammation, it was all the same, right? We're all taught that. That is actually, and all this led to in, airway inflammation, we understood it, so what do you do? Give them a little bronchodilator, give them a little time, things get better. That is a very naive, simplistic, really view of this disease. It is a very, very complex disease. And I hope to bore you to death about the genomics of this because I think it's really important. But the, where the rubber meets the road is we used to think of this as mucus plugging, bronchospasm, and that's what happens, right? If they coughed a little better, you gave them a little more bronchodilator. If a little was good, more must be better. But really what we missed was this. All of this inflammation, all those inflammatory cells, and the degree of inflammation that occurs here, and more importantly, what we're seeing with the airway muscles down here, is really what's starting to happen, is all those muscles start to hypertrophy. And some are reversible, some are not. But this degree of inflammation, this is an inflammatory disease. It is rheumatoid arthritis. It is lupus. It's just in a different variation. And so we have to think of this as an inflammatory disease, not an airway disease. And so it takes a little bit of a paradigm shift 
but I hope to convince you why. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a little bit of a complex view, but again, an, kind of an outdated view. But again, we had, again, the antigens would come in, they would stimulate the epithelial cells and macrophages, they then would become antigen presenting cells, so they would actually stimulate the process further. It would stimulate T cells and uh, go on to other uh, type of uh, cellular lines like B cells, also T cells, and then go on to uh, cytokine uh, release and eosinophils, all re really leading down to this in inflammation. And this seemed kind of a very simplistic and, and easy model. What we know now is that's only part of the story. What we see now is not only do we have antigens, but we have dendritic cells. We have Th2 committed cells. We have T cells that are uncommitted that will commit if they block or combine with eosinophils to become this unknown kind of uh, T cell that generates significant inflammation that's actually causing more endothelial, not epithelial, but endothelial dysfunction. So this disease has become, as we understand it more, much more complex as an inflammatory disease, all leading to this, which is airway smooth muscle hypertrophy, that again can be or may not be reversible. And again, the underappreciation of this disease is they wheeze, make their wheezing go away, and they are somehow better. And actually the wheezing is you relieved a symptom of this inflammatory disease. Just like if you give a leave and their joints don't hurt as much, you haven't solved their disease. You've just made them feel a little better. And this is why patients will turn from, I'm doing okay, I can go home, to I go home and I die. Is really the, that missing point is we don't appreciate that inflammatory process that's occurring at the cellular level. And this is kind of where we are now in a little bit of, this is very simplistic cartoon, but it does tell us where we are right now. One is, there's a huge genomic variation. This is not a ubiquitous disease. This is a genomic disease that phenotypically expresses as a wheeze. But these are 10 diseases, maybe 20 diseases, that just show up as a wheeze. Does that make sense? It's, this is a very diverse disease, all of which can lead to either allergen, complement activation, inflammation, whatever. But where the rubber is really meeting the road is this airway smooth muscle hypertrophy, this airway smooth muscle uh, actually forced generation hypertrophy, all generating into these chronic kids that are wheezing all the time. You know, and there's a difference. We'll talk about these phenotypic difference. The kid that, you know, goes to grandma's house and exposed to a cat and wheezes a little bit, goes home, is fine. That's not asthma, that's a different, he wheezes. But the ones that get this are the ones that go home, do okay for a day or two, and then come back in the ICU or come back to the ER in extremis. It's because of this muscular hypertrophy. Those are what we have to really, I think, identify and get a better handle on how we treat those. So this is a much more simple, really, view. I'm kidding. This is really what it, it looks like more and more is that we have all of this inflammation up here. It generates all of these uh, inflammatory signals. We have uncommitted T cells, we have Th2 cells, we have mast cells, we have dendritic cells, all leading to this muscular contraction that leads to more uh, eosinophilic uh, migration, which is more uh, damaging to the tissues, which leads to all of this, and you just get this vicious circle. And so when you think about treating asthma, you give them an albuterol treatment, you send them home. Kind of seems silly now, doesn't it? When you think of the complexity of this disease, and this is just one type of this disease, but it's a huge disease. Why do we, how do we know this? Well, we know this because the Th2 became very interesting, and I'll give you a historic perspective. There was a group that went to uh, a uh, school in Ghana, and they said, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to deworm all the first and second graders, and we're going to compare their growth to the third and fourth graders that are present and see how deworming makes them grow taller. And, and we can pat ourselves on the back and we'll have this great thing. And they, they went back six months later 
And the kids in the first, second grade actually grew. They did. They, they grew better. They, they were a little heavier, a little taller. Their atopic dermatitis went up 200%. Their asthma rates went up 300%. They said, well, you know, just an anomaly, we'll come back. Six months later, they came back, same thing. Atopic dermatitis went up almost 300%. Asthma went up 400%. So they said, what's going on? They started looking at it. And what they found is all these kids we were deworming, we were dropping their T2 cells. Because when you have worms, your T2 cells are very high. So if you see an antigen, you get a little bump. You take the worms away, T2 cells go to zero. You show an antigen, you get this hyperactive response, and they get this airway. So this thing that we think we were doing well actually turned out to be not so good. And, but it did allow people to look at the T2 cells and say, hey, this is a big part of asthma right now. And so there's actually a study right now out of NIH where they're taking extract of roundworm and using that as a therapy for asthma. I don't want to be in that study, but it is a study. But what I'm saying is, you know, trying to do well, we thought we were doing something good, but actually the body had its own natural mechanism howling to deal with asthma. And so um, there's a guy out of England that's done a lot of this work, and he says, you know, why has asthma gone up? you know, 400, 500% in most communities, and he thinks it's because of deworming programs. So maybe it's better to be wormed and short and breathe better, I don't know. But uh, it's, it's just an interesting uh, aside. So this is much more of what asthma is today. It's a complex, problematic disease that has multifacets. And one of the things is, is we've, like I said, always before, if really concentrated on the allergen. If we can control the allergen, asthma goes away. Well, kind of, kind of not. It helps. If you're allergic to cats, don't be around cats, it helps. You know, if you're allergic to peanuts, don't eat peanuts, it probably helps. The problem is, if it's something that is diffuse, like ragweed or molds or something that you can't really avoid, what starts happening is we start really looking at the microbiome has changed. How has that changed? Kids get antibiotics all the time, right? The average kid gets, what, four antibiotics before the age of two on average? And that they, I think that's the statistic. It's, it's pretty high. So the microbiome has changed. That changes the immunology, and it changes this. The genomics, we're really starting to appreciate. And the epigenetics. You know what epigenetics is? Epigenetics is a DNA uh, passed on process that is not in your normal gene, DNA. It can be a methylation of a DNA product or a methylation of a gene. It changes the gene output, but it's not transmitted from family to family. So it's an acute issue with that particular patient. And then what we're really finding is these T regulatory cells and other T regulatory cells are starting to come in. And really, what we didn't know is they're very much affected by environment and foods. And so it's not simple that you know you're born with this innate immune system. These innate immune systems are very actually dynamic and actually very flexible. And they actually go into generating this childhood asthma. Again, we have to look at this as a very, very complex disease. Even our treatments that we think are simplistic aren't simplistic. And when I uh, first got interested in this and a few years ago, we started looking at Really, um, why do kids do really well with some treatments? And why do kids do really bad with other treatments? And why do we have some kids that are in all the time, they're getting the same treatment, and you can't cure the bronchospasm, although you should? Um, and we really started looking at there is huge genomic variation in the therapy. And if you look at this therapy, and this is just actually beta blocker, adrenergic therapy, glucocorticosteroids. Look at the number of perturbations and feedback loops that are there. All of these seem to have genomic predilections for individuals. So you could have a really good response to a beta agonist, and you could have absolutely no response to beta agonist, basically based on your parents. So pick your parents well, right? That's always the whole thing, pick your parents well. This is why we really need to look at asthma as a, as a much broader uh, thing. And if you look at beta agonist alone, 
we're finding out now, and I'll show a slide later, the huge genomic variation that people have in, in the responsiveness of beta agonists, which is why you just can't give them an inhaler and send them home and say, come back. Particularly someone that's come to the ER in an extremist and can just give them something and send them home and hope they do better. Because again, of those patients that die, 85% were seen in the previous 24 hours. Well-intentioned people. I think just really uh, underappreciative of the process. Well, we know what happens. You know, the beta adrenergics, they stimulate adenocyclase, they lead to cyclic AMP, PK, you, you inhibit or limit calcium activation, and it generates relaxation. Very simplistic. The problem is I have genomic variations here, 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 and always here. And so again, pick your parents well if you're going to have asthma. Even in steroids, and we know how steroids work. You know, you have the glucocorticosteroid binds with the receptor. It goes to the nucleus and inhibits NF-kappa B, I-kappa B, which are the nuclear signals that generate inflammation. And this alone, just in the genomic receptor, there are 134 variations that we know of. Probably 200 now since I've looked. So all of this is some kids are steroid responsive, some aren't. Some are beta agonist responsive, some are not. How do you tell? Because you can't look at them and tell the difference. We've got to get a little better and a little smarter. So we kind of come up with this algorithm, right? You have asthma. We give you beta adrenergics, maybe anticholinergics. Hopefully you get some steroids, maybe leukotriene inhibitors. And we all hope that that gets you better. Again, if you look at it, bronchospasm, bronchospasm, inflammation, inflammation. We're trying to treat it. And we're actually doing a pretty good job. If you look at death rates, they have leveled off at least. The incidence has gone up, but the death rates have seemed to have leveled off. So we've gotten a little better at understanding inflammation. But if you look at the data now, what we're starting to get into in asthma is biologics. Monoclonal antibodies towards different uh, actually processes of inflammation, not a bronchospasm. So all of these biologic, there are six in trials right now for asthma, uh, and all of those are addressed towards inflammation. So how do patients get in trouble? Well, we know that normally you have, uh, if you take a deep breath, you get a little negative airway pressure relative to atmospheric, and your pleural pressure is always negative. And so you generate only minus one, minus two, your alveoli uh, open up, right? You get a deep breath in, and they just go back and forth the whole time. And it's all because of this negative airway. But it's only minus one, minus two. Not a lot. If you add asthma in, what happens that bronchoconstriction causes that you get air in, but because of that bronchoconstriction, you can't get air out. Simple. The problem is, and what happens is, you have negative airway pressure at zero, but you start getting high positive pressures in the alveolus. And so what happens, what it takes to move air now is what? Greater than minus 10. A deep sigh is minus 5. So to try to generate that much energy, what happens? You've got to take deep breaths all the time. You've got to do it fast because your CO2 starts rising because you're not exhaling as much, right? Remember, you don't need ventilation to oxygenate. Oxygen is a passive process. You get oxygen in the alveoli, it passively move, moves across uh, the alveolus to the capillaries, to the arterial system. You don't need ventilation, but you need ventilation to move CO2, because remember, CO2 is 40 times the volatility of oxygen. So it, has to, it leaves the vascular space quick, but you've got to get it out to give room for oxygen in so that those alveoli don't start increasing, increasing, increasing. So what happens? Well, what happens is, you know, you take a deep breath. You take this deep breath. You exhale. You try to go back, but your CO2 starts rising. So your brainstem is saying, breathe faster. So you breathe faster. But then you're not going back to baseline. And what happens, this auto peep keeps going up. So to move air, now it's plus 12. I've got to do greater than minus 12. It's 
almost impossible to do. So what happens is that your air, you start fatiguing, your airway muscles can't keep up with it, you start failing, your CO2 rises. When CO2 rises, then your PO2 falls, and that's really what generates really acute collapse and acute asthma. And we'll talk about how we manipulate this in therapy in, in a few minutes. And so what we have is this huge kind of circle that generates this death. And one is that those alveoli start getting huge, huge, huge. It starts putting more strain on the right heart. Now asthma becomes a heart disease. How many people think of asthma as a heart disease? Right? Almost no one. As soon as you start getting an extremist, it becomes a heart disease. And the reason is, is because of this, is because you get high right ventricular hypertrophy. That causes flattening of the interventricular septum between the right and the left ventricle. That causes, actually, diastolic dysfunction. If it starts to bow, you get so much airway pressure that your right heart really starts to struggle. It actually bows into the left ventricle. Now you get left ventricular dysfunction. So now asthma becomes not an airway problem, it's a heart problem. And this is why how this disease becomes underappreciated is because we think of it as an airway problem and not as a heart problem. But it becomes a heart problem really quick. Because what happens is when that happens, you become acidotic because your left ventricular function isn't flowing. So what happens? You're acidotic. What do you want to do? Breathe faster. What does that do? Make your asthma worse. Then suddenly, you get the hypoxia, the pulmonary constriction. You get worse edema. And then you can see how this vicious cycle starts to occur. So this airway problem becomes a heart problem that becomes a death problem. And it becomes really, really quick. And once you get into this cycle, this is why they die on the way to the hospital. And that's why they die of hypoxia. It's because much of their problem is heart. So we have to treat them very, very aggressively and very differently. The other thing that happens is during inspiration, particularly if they're generating these high pressures, is we get transcapillary movement of fluid. So you get airway edema, but just the process of breathing that fast and that hard you get air, uh, fluid movement into the airway, which causes more airway inflammation, more airway irritation, more airway constriction. And because of that high breathing and high interthoracic pressure, you get left ventricular afterload dysfunction. Again, it becomes a heart problem. So this airway problem became a heart problem that causes more airway problems, that causes more heart problems. You can see how these patients get bad very quickly and die very quickly. And again, it's an underappreciated process with asthma because we think about it as wheezing. And this is why I think 85% of the kids are seen 24 hours before death. It's that underappreciation of the pathophysiology of the disease because we were taught, and I was taught, it's an airway problem. Right? It's an irritation problem. It's a bronchospasm problem. And it just ain't. So let's turn to really why we're here is asthma in genomic terms. And the reason why I'm saying this is we know now in the ATS and the American Association of Allergy Immunology have actually defined nine different phenotypes of asthma with about 100 different genomic variations of those phenotypes. So it's become a disease that I actually don't want to study anymore because it wears me out. <clears throat> But we basically kind of broken it down into five different processes. And one is, we know there's variations in clinical. We see that all the time, right? Some kids do well, some don't, it doesn't matter. We also see in the pathology, we some that have significant inflammation and some that have significant remodeling. So there's a variation within the variation, and that's called uh, uh, endotypes. So the, among the phenotypes, there are endotypes of the phenotypes. And we have to understand that, too. We know there's physiologic variation. Kids do well. And the main one, I think, is right here, is there's variation in response to therapy. And we just think some kids aren't compliant, or the mom's not compliant. That may be true. Well, in our case, it's a lot of true. But a lot of times, it's, they are compliant. They're just, you have the wrong treatment because they are a different phenotype, or a different genomic type. And they're just not going to respond. And we know that there's variations in phenotype, or prognostic uh, factors. And so we've kind of broken these down so that we understand 
that there are different types of asthma. And this is kind of how we've broken down. There's allergic asthma, there's intrinsic asthma, uh, there's neutrophilic asthma, which is very different than eosinophilic asthma, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then there's aspirin-induced, uh, there's obesity-induced. We've actually expanded this even further. Um, all of these tell you that you have to start getting a little smarter about the patient that you're seeing with asthma. And trying to identify them as, where are they in this, and do I need to adjust their therapy? Is this a kid that, hey, his phenotype is such that he's not responding, and he should respond, then maybe we need to think about other therapies, like biologics. Not just doing the same thing and saying, well, you know, if two puffs are good, give them four. And we start thinking of other therapies. Again, if you look at, and this is the frustrating part of this disease, these are just the known genomic variations that we've, that we've seen right now. And these are just known. And there's a, uh, a full uh, genome array now that they're looking at. They're taking, it's a, actually out of McGill University, they're taking all of these asthma patients, taking blood, sputum, and they're actually doing whole genome arrays trying to figure out all of these. And they're finding gene after gene after gene after gene affects these patients that actually wheeze. And so it's become, uh, again, a very complex problem. But if you look at life-threatening phenotypes, and that's what I'm here to talk about is life-threatening, and this is where I think we can actually start applying these very basic science issues, I think, to the clinic is there are four really, I think, identified phenotypes. One is that anaphylaxis is sudden airway obstruction. That's a kid that's peanut allergy, eats a peanut. Right, he just, just bad luck. The other is the kid that gets exposed. Uh, these are much more an animal where they get much more just acute airway hyperresponsiveness and they get a lot of airway mucus and they get mucus plugging. The three and four is what we see the most. And that is the one that takes hours to develop. This is the kid that's chronically uh, allergic, uh, has asthma all the time, suddenly gets exposed to something has a genomic variation of that something, and he's actually gets him into the ICU. And those patients actually, interestingly enough, have very eosinophilic process within their airways. So it goes to show, you know, just these very hyper responsive airways. And then we have the fast onset, and these are kids that we don't understand very well, but they actually end up, they die quick, they get sick quick, they get very severe really quick. They're admitted to the ICU quick. They actually have neutrophils. Actually, look at their airways in postmortem. They don't actually have eosinophils. They have neutrophils. A different process. So there's something else going on that's, even though it's maybe allergy-induced, their pathway is neutrophilic. And I'll show you why that's problematic, uh, hopefully, in a second. So, you know, if you look at it, we, we see these patients with asthma. And we don't understand it, but we have some with eosinophils and some with neutrophils. And what we're finding is really what's separating a lot of what we do is these are the kids that love steroids. You give them steroids, they do well. These are the kids that you can give them steroids till the cows come home, give them beta adrenergic cows come home, and they're not going to do better. The only thing that makes it better is time, unless we get into biologics, uh, which we hope to. But so we're actually to these phenotypes. And so if you can, in the clinic, just imagine, I got a kid that every time he gets steroids, he does great. He feels great, his energy is great, he's back in school, does well. Those are probably the eosinophilic. You get the kid that's in all the time, you know, can't go home, can't get back to school. Those are probably much more neutrophilic uh, induced type asthmas. Those are the ones that are very refractory to therapies. Those are the ones that get the muscular hypertrophy. And those are the ones that we see the most that come in and die. Different process, which is why it's so aggravating. He got steroids. He got all this. Why did he die? That makes sense. Well, it, may, it makes sense when you start thinking. So now we have this Zen diagram that's again, gives me uh, migraines. But it does tell you that all of these factors are going into the severe asthma. But it's not a ubiquitous disease. It's a very uh, heterogenomic disease. So that's bad enough. You got bad parents. Well, then your parents also said, I'm not only going to give you bad genes for asthma, I'm not going to let you respond to pharmacotherapy like everyone else. 
And so what we're finding is these pharmacogenomics. And we know there's difference, but there's 49 validated genomic polymorphisms of the adrenergic receptor. And they vary from absolutely no response to hyperacute response. So the kids that come in a wheeze, you get, you, you know, they just walk by an albuterol and, and they get better. Those are hyper responsive. The ones that you give them repetitive, repetitive, repetitive therapies are probably these refractory. What we find is, and particularly as gene is a mediator process, and it seems to mediate this uh, receptor, is two of those genes are very prominent in African American males. And we've looked at this, and every patient we've had on ECMO for asthma has been African American male in this area. It's very prominent in this area for probably a reason. Now, the, the people that did this work were at Hopkins, also had a very high African American population. Same thing. They saw it, and they saw that these patients are very hypo responsive to beta adrenergic therapy. And these are the ones that get in trouble. Uh, if you look at glucocortic steroids, 131 SNPs now that we know about. Single poly, uh, nucleotide polymorphism in 14 different genes. So even your responsible glucocorticosteroids are responsible uh, by your parents. Leukotrienes, yep, yeah, they got them too. So the singular responsive, the unsingular, the singular non-responsive, they got genomic variations too. And uh, we have to get smarter and better about trying to understand this disease. And the reason is because, again, kids are still dying. And it comes down to this is we don't understand, we know the mechanisms, we understand all these processes. What we don't understand is how can I identify that kid, right? Kid comes to the ER, how do you know? You know they, they don't have a dysmorphism. You know, they, they, they don't come with a little card that says I'm, you know, beta adrenergic hypo-responsive. How do you identify them? Uh, and we hope that biomarkers will help us in the future, but we're really, really relying on this, uh, this process, and that is there's a gene network. We know that genes cause genetic variants, which cause transcriptomes, proteomes, and metab metabolomics. What we're trying to do is get smarter from there up to try to get you biomarkers to say, okay, here's a kid, he came in, he's gotten three treatments, he's not better, maybe I need to work him up. What is his X level? So what we're looking at is there are 13 different biomarkers in trials right now just looking at asthma severity and trying to identify those kids that look good, seem to be okay, but go home and do poorly. And there's maybe some biologic biomarkers that will come out that will help you uh, other than uh, just what we have now, which is basically clinical. Here is that, uh, what the I think, the landmark article uh, for one of the beta adrenergic uh, therapies, and, and they showed this, that these kids just don't respond, and there's a huge number of them, and actually in one cohort, uh, and this was out of, um, I think it was uh, Birmingham, about 80% had one of these polymorphisms in African American males. So again, what do we see? And I, I think we've talked about this before, is the kids that are coming in that can't get better African-American males. So we probably have a very high population in this area. So biomarkers, what's out there? These are the ones that are actually out there. And I'm not going to explain them all, thank God, right, for y'all. Um, but there's a ton of them out there that we're really trying to look at is there's something else that we can do, right? Some way that you can identify these kids and say they're really bad and these are the ones that are going to crash. And these are in the works. And I think you'll see in the next two or three years some of these coming out. They maybe come out in a panel. You know, there's three or four. They'll say, okay, he's hyper-responsive to corticosteroids. He's hyper-responsive to leukotrienes. He's very dramatically responsive to adrenergics. And I think that'll help our therapy quite a bit. But again, what I'm here to talk about is near-fatal asthma, which is really uh, what I get into. This is what we have so far. You know, we have the end-of-bed test, right? They're restless, inability to speak, they're cyanotic. Yeah, of course, they're bad. They've got pulses paradoxes, yeah, they're bad. Some of the objective measures, um, you know, FEV1, uh, that actually doesn't work. FEVF doesn't work very well. But those are what people propose to do, none of which have actually been shown to be predictive. So these kids that you're seeing, they can have all of these except the top, 
clinical signs and the objective signs, it really has no correlation with the ones that go home and die and the ones that, that actually do well. So if you look at 2 to 4 percent of hospitalized patients require invasive mechanical ventilation, 7 percent die. That's a really high number for potentially reversible disease, right? Asthma is reversible. That's a lot of people that die. And why do they die? Um, one is the goal is to maintain oxygenation. We can't all the time. Relief airway flow obstruction, we can't all the time. We can't reduce airway edema because we can't control that heart failure. They get severe mucus plugging. You can't just go in and suck it out. And we have a very poor uh, history of preventing complications of mechanical ventilation and other therapies for life-threatening asthma. So these are what have been associated and kind of help you if they've previously been intubated, uh, they've been in the emergency care the last year, all of these things go on, not currently on inhaled corticosteroids, they have psychiatric disease, uh, all of these go into the ones that have the highest mortality, but a lot of it is the mortality is therapy. And so what happens when you get that sick, we put you on mechanical ventilation, we don't stop complications, we don't really treat you that well, uh, and those are the ones that end up actually uh, probably dying. And the reason is, there's a couple of reasons. One is, it's really maddening, because remember I talked about the neutrophilic infiltration, which is a big problem. What happens to these patients? They get hypoxic. What do we do? We give them oxygen, right? Because you have to. They're hypoxic. What does that do? Well, we know that inflammation generates neutrophilic recruitment. It's normal. When the neutrophils come in and they break down, they actually release adenosine, which is awesome because it's a negative feedback loop. The adenosine goes to the A2A receptor, which actually goes and releases chemokines that actually is entire role in life is to actually stop neutrophilic recruitment. It's a nice, beautiful negative feedback loop. Oxygen actually inhibits that. Because we evolved from a low oxygen to 21%, not from a high. So we give high oxygen. We actually have HIF molecules and other molecules that sense oxygen as a harm. So our therapy becomes harmful. And so this is, again, one of the reasons why uh, therapy becomes a really problematic. So we have to expand our therapy and say, okay, we've given all of these and life-threatening asthma, we immediately have to go to BiPAP, mechanical ventilation, and ECLS, and try to prevent complications, get them through the process, and hope they do better. Uh, and that's just the... So what's the goal? Well, the first goal, you've given them treatment. They come in the ER. They're an extremist. One of the things we really recommend first is non-invasive ventilation. The goal is reduce work of breathing, uh, et cetera. And why does this work? And why do we use non-invasive ventilation? Remember this paradigm I showed you before where it's zero here and 10 here? So you had to move minus 10. Well, if we put in non-invasive ventilation and we made this 10, which matched your auto peak, what does it take to move air? That's minus one. Doesn't take much of anything. And so that's why don't let kids struggle. Put them on non-invasive ventilation quick. They start struggling, put them on that quickly, and I think you'll see significant improvement. Uh, I'm not going to show that YouTube. It was a guy struggling uh, with non-invasive ventilation. And my point was, the reason is it wouldn't play well, um, is he was on non-invasive ventilation. He was on it. He was struggling, and no one was around him. When you put someone on non-invasive ventilation, the first thing you have to do is commit your respiratory therapist. You're staying here until they're comfortable. Because it's not something you can say, put them on 8 and 10 and hope they get better. It may be 8 now, maybe 12 later. They have to stay at the bedside and adjust it. And so you have to have commitment. And so here's this guy struggling, struggling, struggling. No one was near him. And adjusting this minute to minute, he ended up getting intubated. I'm telling you if the respiratory therapist would have been there and adjusted it, because you have to adjust that auto peak minute to minute, it would have helped and may have avoided that. So the goal of treatment is to control oxygenation, or improve it, control pH. And if you go to mechanical ventilation, there's always questions. The problem is what we have is this. They get a breath on a mechanical ventilation, whether it's non-invasive or not. They exhale, 
and it takes them forever. I mean, the inhale, they take it forever to exhale. If they're not up to baseline and I give them breath here, I increase that intrinsic PEEP even further. So what was plus 10 is now plus 12 or plus 14. Now what do they have to do to breathe? Minus 14, minus 15. And what happens is you increase their dynamic hyperinflation. It makes their right heart failure worse. And that's really what kills them. And actually, we kill a lot of people with a ventilator because we don't appreciate this expiratory time. And this is what gives you a pneumothorax. Because I do this repetitively, repetitively, now your alveolar pressure is plus 30. What's going to happen? At some point, it's going to pop. And it does. They get a pneumothorax. And actually, one of the things that actually kills them. So mode, there's no advantage to mode. Rate depends on that flow. And so I'm going to give you a case report. Here's one. He's a 10-year-old. These are real cases that were here. Uh, known asthma, presented with wheezing, received beta adrenergic therapy, and improved and was discharged. Same scenario, right? Seen 24 hours. Returned several minutes later, severe respiratory distress. It wasn't several minutes, about an hour. You can see CO2 was 88, rose to 100, and he was intubated. His intrinsic PEEP, and you can measure that, was 14. So to take a deep breath, you need minus 15. So no, no wonder he was retaining CO2. You just, muscles can't do that. He was placed on that, very low tidal volumes. Um, we looked at his flow curve. He could get a rate of 8, which means it took him about you know, uh, 8 seconds to uh, exhale. And you could see his PCO2 was 100. So what was next? Well, again, bad adrenergic, uh, steroids, magnesium. There was no real improvement. And we actually uh, ended up putting him on Avcor, which we basically just sucked down the CO2 and basically turned the ventilator off. And just said, we're not going to kill him with the ventilator. We're just going to let him wheeze until he gets better. And we could remove this. This actually was developed here. Actually, you see this fog right here. That's all CO2. Uh, it basically just removes CO2. And it's just a process. We can put it in in 10 minutes in the ER, um, and it works very well. And we were able to turn his ventilator just basically to CPAP. And uh, we had it on him for about 18 hours, able to pull it off, got his bronchospasm under control. And you can see here, real rapid drop in his uh, PCO2 and improvement in his pH. Again, by turning off the ventilator, but just treating his inflammation, which is really what we did. Here's another kid. This is a 13-year-old, respiratory distress. He was intubated. He only could take two milliliters per kilo without a peak pressure. And he took 15 seconds to exhale. You give him a breath, it took 15 seconds before he was back to baseline. So the fastest rate we could give him was four. So what happened? His PCO2 was 188. Only a kid would survive that, right? So there's just no other way. Um, and again, we put, this is, Poor slide, but we put him on the same thing. Within 30 minutes, we have his PCO2 to 50 uh, by turning his ventilator all, actually off. Again, just using tools other than ventilation. And again, same tool, same mechanism. Again, took us 10 minutes to put it in. Um, and uh, we were able to, I think, do a lot. And um, we actually published this in pediatric critical care uh, a couple of years ago. Get a lot of notoriety from LSU for this, uh, and now uh, most centers are using a similar type system. And of course, we can always do ECMO. And what I'm trying to say, and these are the references I used, is try to look at asthma a little differently. And you get a kid in the ER, and you're treating them, and they're just not responding. Hang on to them. Don't send them home. Let them phenotype themselves out if that makes sense. Because if you try to you know, say they're asthma and just send them home because of efficiency, uh, you'll get in trouble. Let them phenotype themselves out. And then once they phenotype themselves out, then design their therapy. And I think you'll be much more successful and it'll prevent us from that same scenario of 85% of them coming, you know, have seen a nurse pra or a, a, a practitioner uh, right before they die. And I, I think that's a shame. So, any questions? How is the to MAG and some of the other non-traditional asthma meds that we're using a lot more now? My bias on MAG is you should use it almost right away. 
if you have someone that is on their second or third treatment, uh, and you know if they're not improving, I think mag should be uh, very early in therapy, whether inhaled or IV. Uh, is there a difference on efficacy from inhaled versus IV? Inhaled is probably not as good as IV, but if you don't have an IV in, uh, and you think, you know, I think if I just give them a little time, they'll do better. Uh, inhaled mag, and we just wrote a protocol uh, uh, that's, I think, going through PMT soon, or may have gone through PMT. So we have a protocol for it. And it's also actually very good in, in, uh, in small babies with uh, bronchiolitis uh, that are wheezing. The I talked to Brandon about using it on the floor, and he said the problem is you're committing a respiratory therapist to about an hour at the bedside when you order inhaled mag, and we don't necessarily have the resources for that. So IV is pretty much going to be the route on the floor. And, and I've argued that because they don't need to be there. If you get nervous about mag, go to the fourth floor. Where they're given 20 grams, you know, we're given 500 right. well, in nursing, milligrams. Well, nursing protocol on the floor, they have to infuse it over two hours, and so I've told the residents, if you think they're bad enough, grab a computer, go sit at their bedside for 20. If they're really bad, then they're going to have to be put on the floor for two hours. And then we have to wait for the next patient to come in. Right. 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 I mean, it's in the MAG policy, high-risk policy, so I don't know why not. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the danger in, in MAG is very, very high levels, but you're talking 8, 9, 10. Yeah. We're trying to get levels of 2 and 3. Yeah, 50 for kids, you know, we're not. No, you're not doing it. But remember, serum levels do not respond to respond, or do not correlate response. Right. Because what I always get is, well, their MAG level is normal. MAG is an intracellular process that occurs. It's not extracellular. You're measuring extracellular mag, not intracellular mag. Intracellular is what, what counts. So you need to know that. On the mag, what do you think about one time versus like Q6? No, I, I think if, if they're sick enough that you, it, it, it depends. If they're sick enough and, they, and they're hospitalized that you determine they need to have repetitive, not once. That's, uh, that's my thought too. But yeah, I, no, they, they need to have repetitive therapy. And the reason is, is the mechanism of action bypasses the beta 2 receptor. And the reason why, what are we reintroducing? The Theophylline. What have we done with a couple of those kids? Reintroduce the Theophylline. Why? Because the Theophylline bypasses the beta 2 receptor. So I don't have to worry. And these kids, particularly these African American males, um, I'm recommending, and we start it now in the ICU, if they come in and they're in, in status, they're getting the off one right away. Now, I have to look up the dose every day because right. I can't remember it, but I used to know it like crazy. But we're back to that because it bypasses. Remember, it's a direct right uh, inhibitor of cyclo-KMP breakdown. So it's not dependent on uh, the beta-2 receptor. So it doesn't matter what genomics are. As far as we know, there's no theophylline genomics. Probably is, but we don't know about it. So those. Those kids that are really hyper-responsive or hypo-responsive or they're just not getting better, put them on the you know, go That's back I think to we'll have to start talking about some more, too. We have a kid who just came back in who was here, and now he's back, and he's on the one. One of the things, though, when you look at, like, his feet, we'll have to go back to all the Theophylline mm -hmm. level stuff because, like, his Theophylline <coughs> was low, but he was doing well, so we left it. Now he's back in, so then it's like, do you increase... Well, I, I think, you know, the other thing you have to look at is leukotriene. You know, leukotriene is dose-specific. You know, what we get caught up in is what's the maximum dose of leukotriene. I don't think there is a maximum dose of leukotriene within reason. But if they're not responding to 10, go to 20. Because there is probably significant genomic variation in response to leukotriene inhibitors. So push, push the envelope. They're not toxic. Uh, they have a very safe margin. Push it, and then come back and look how. The reason is, is because of that, that 85, and we have no predictability of that 85%. Until we get these biomarkers that are out there that can say, this kid's going to crash and this one ain't, um, we have to, I think, get very, very aggressive. Because once they come to the ICU, I'm so far behind the eight ball. And who was here with our last asthma ECMO? I like a dirty dog, right? Because... He was so far behind, we could not ventilate him. And to ventilate him, and even though he went on Avcor and ECMO, 
At that point, his CO2 had been so high, he actually got cerebral edema and died of cerebral edema. And, you know, it was probably not preventable from us, but I you kind of wonder, the previous six months, we have done a better job in identifying him because if you talk to mom, he's been in, not here, thank goodness. I mean, it was a, once a week. He was in somebody's clinic in not responding to therapy. So, we, like I said, so think of phenotypes and think of genotypes and then modify your therapy. What I don't want you to do is look at up to date and say this is what we do. Start phenotyping these patients and, and letting them express their phenotype to you. And I think they'll be more successful. What are your thoughts or recommendations if you're in the ER and have these would you admit those kids? No. No. If they do well and they're doing, but you got to hang on to them. What, what happens in the ER is admit them or send them home. Wrong, wrong answer, right? You know, no, I'm going to hang on to them. I think they can go home in four or five more hours. So you, you have to be firm because administration wants you to move them or admit them or move them. Some of these kids don't need to be admitted. Or if you admit them, admit them 23 hour OBS, which doesn't really exist anymore, right? But, you know, admit them short term. But hang on to them, uh, and they will. They will, you know. It's almost rare that they will never, you know, uh, declare themselves. And if they're old enough, you know what's the best test of all the tests that we have? FEV1, ABGs, chest X-rays, all that. How you feeling? I'm better. I feel good. You're probably okay. <laughs> so, how many people ask that? You know, you okay? Yeah, I think so. Not the right answer. <laughs> I got to be well. I got to. Yeah, I'm. I'm back to. I'm back to myself. Um, but hang on to them. Uh, and, and if they start pushing you, push back a little bit. But if you're in doubt, admit them. You can send them home the next morning. Uh, but you don't want to. Just do OBS and we'll tuck them in overnight. Yeah. Absolutely. And if it's if you're on your second dose of mag, absolutely admit them. If they've been there that long, absolutely admit them. It's better to have them here for two days than to have in the ICU for 10. I have a, oh, you can oh. go okay. I have, I'm only bringing this up because it's a new comeback. Albuterol versus Zopinex. <laughs> Me, levo rotatory versus non? Yeah. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> I don't think there's enough of a difference. I have not seen that much of a difference. Genomically, there appears to be no difference. Uh, it's just, I, I, I'm an albuterol guy and I always have been. I've not seen Zofinax spare the heart any more than, you know, the reason these patients are tachycardic, a lot of them, particularly the severe ones, is not because you gave them a beta adrenergic, it's because they have left ventricular heart failure and they're trying to compensate. So you make their asthma better, their heart rate will go down. So it's not uncommon to give them albuterol and the heart rates go down. So, you know, so I, I don't buy into that. I think it was a, it's, it's a, it's an awesome marketing ploy, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's a reality. Uh, at least not my practice. I mean, Dr. Bonham may argue with me, but um, like I said, I'm thinking, my frame of reference is ICU and what we see that comes to the ICU and trying to prevent that. So unfortunately, the, uh, the emergency department has been becoming the primary care for many of our families and patients. <clears throat> so if the patient had, has a few, a few visits to the ER with asthma, should we consider that we should send this patient on some kind of maintenance medication, maybe inhaled uh, corticosteroid, or maybe um, uh, ecotrine? Uh, I, 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 I'm a big believer just because we don't have the tools to separate those. So I'm a big believer in over therapy and then trying to get them into a clinic. I mean, the only thing that's really going to solve it is, like you said, repetitive being seen. And, you know, you know some kid over a year or two, uh, seeing a different person at ER is never a good idea. But I, 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 and again, I'm biased because all I see is the bad. I don't see the good asthmas, you know. All I see is the bad. I, I'm a big believer in getting home on something chronic because they came in for a reason and you're sending them back to the same environment. Their environment didn't change. You know, it's not like they came out of jail and you're going to send them home. They came from home and you're going to send them back home. So 
And those kids, I think it's, it's very important to get them on something chronic, unless their environment is drastically changing. What are your thoughts on uh, tributylene? Tributylene, yeah. continuous, or intermittent? intermittent. Uh, I don't use it. Uh, if you look at the data, particularly the, the data that came out, either continuous or intermittent, it offered no advantage over spotting albuterol. Now, will I use continuous albuterol? Uh, very rarely. Uh, I go to non-invasive inhalation very quickly because non-invasive inhalation changes the dynamics of their airway hunger. And if I can't change their airway hunger, I'm not going to get distribution of that anyway. All it's going to do is deposit in the trachea. I'm really not getting, and there's actually xenon studies that have shown that, that it just deposits in the trachea. It doesn't really get in the alveolus anyway, or the lower airway uh, where it needs to be. So all you're doing is moving this. Makes you feel better, gives you warm and fuzzies, but it's not probably doing any good. Go to a non-invasive really quick. But your respiratory therapist has to stay there and adjust it. So, uh, is there any evidence about uh, one dose of what are decadron versus the uh, five days of uh, what are Because of the, the, the degree of inflammation, I think a lot of it depends historically. If if they have responded to that in the past, they'll probably respond again. If they've been refractory to corticosteroids, or they got decadron and they were back in their primary care two days later, they need chronic therapy. So. Um, I'm much more in favor of long term. Just because when I study this disease, all I see is inflammation. You know, it, you wouldn't treat rheumatoid arthritis with one dose of ibuprofen, even if it's long acting. So, a leaf. So if I, you know, you're not going to do that. You're going to put them on something more chronic and then get them established and then try to figure it out. Thank you. Thank you.